Once again, for those who have been here with us the last two weeks, you'll recall that I've been preaching a three-part series on what happens after we die. So two weeks ago, I preached on hell. Last week was on purgatory. And then today, we finally get where we have really been going, and that is, of course, heaven. But before we get to discussing heaven, I just want to review a little bit of where we have been. The church teaches what are known as the four last things. There are two certainties and two possibilities. So the two certainties are death and judgment. That's going to happen to everybody. The two possibilities, heaven and hell. Which one you wind up in is really up to you. It is entirely your choice. Personally, I recommend heaven, but it is your choice. Depending on how our moment of judgment goes, we discover our eternal destiny. And it really comes down to one thing. Did we die in a state of grace? If we died in a state of grace, we will go to heaven. We might have to make a little pit stop along the way in purgatory, but we'll get there eventually. If we did not die in a state of grace, we will lose our salvation. It really is that simple. And that's not my opinion. That is the teaching of the church, and it has been for 2,000 years. And so that's what we, that's what we believe. But I think it's worth reflecting for just a moment on what that judgment will be like, what that moment of judgment when we stand before Christ will be like. There have been many, many people who have gone through a so-called near-death experience, and they have different perspectives, but there's a few things that really kind of seem to stand out when people report having gone through that. And one is that they often will say that their life flashed before their eyes. Now, this makes total sense, and I suspect that that is probably accurate, because I imagine when we stand before Christ, we will, in fact, see the entirety of our life from beginning to end, and we'll see where did we do well, where did we not do so well, where did we respond to God's invitation, and where did we not. But then after that happens, then what comes next? Well, we don't really know. Because by definition, anyone who has been through that moment of judgment hasn't lived to tell about it. And so we, we can only speculate. But here's my conception of it. For what it's worth, this is how I envision it in my mind. I used to think of that moment of judgment as like a balance you know, like a scale, and you, you put your good deeds over here, your bad deeds over here, and you hope that this side outweighs this side. That's wrong. Okay, I realize that that is not a Catholic way of thinking about it. Rather, I think a far better way to conceptualize this is as follows. When we stand before the Lord, our souls will be laid bare, and we will see our soul as God sees it. And as a result of seeing our soul as God sees it, we will respond in one of two ways, which will determine our eternal destiny. If we see our soul as being united, <clears throat> excuse me, united to Christ in a state of grace, we will run to him and be drawn to him naturally, almost like a magnet is drawn to metal quite naturally. However, if we see our soul and we see that we are not united to him in grace and that we see the horror of a soul not in grace, out of fear, very much like the servant with the one talent in the gospel today, out of fear, we will turn and run away from the Lord, never to return. And so, as I said, heaven and hell really are a choice. We choose our eternal destiny. As I said at the beginning, I strongly recommend you choose heaven, but ultimately it is in fact your choice, and the Lord will honor that. And so that finally brings us to a little bit of a reflection on heaven. Hopefully this is where we all want to go. Hopefully that's our destiny and our desire. Now just like the moment of judgment, we can't say for sure what heaven will be like. We don't know. Why? Because everybody who's gone there hasn't come back to tell us by definition. Now, there have been a few saints who have had a vision of heaven and have written about it. The most famous of these saints is, of course, St. John the Evangelist, who wrote of his vision in the book of Revelation, and it is contained in the Word of God even today. 
And so if you want to know what John thinks of heaven, read the book of Revelation, chapters 20 through 22. St. Paul tells us that eye has not seen and ear has not heard what God has prepared for those who love him. And so in other words, we can, dist- we can try to describe what heaven's going to be like, but ultimately, in the final analysis, our puny language isn't even going to come close. There is no word in the English language that can describe the glories that God has in store for us in heaven. Again, by way of analogy, consider, I mean, just think of this idea. Imagine that you have a little baby, and this baby is still in its mother's womb, so it hasn't been born yet. And imagine, just follow the analogy, that this baby can talk. You go up to this little baby and you say, what do you think the world on the outside is going to look like? After you're born, what do you think it's going to look like? I imagine that little baby might say something like this. I don't know, but I know it must be great because my mom's there and she loves me. I think we could say the same thing about heaven. What's it going to be like? I don't know, but I know that it must be great because my heavenly father is there and he loves me and he loves you too. Nonetheless, there are still a few things that we can say about heaven, and it actually is simpler to begin by saying what it is not. So, a couple of things that heaven is not. First of all, when we die, we do not become angels. Right? We hear that said quite frequently, you know, oh, heaven gained another angel today. And colloquially, that's fine. Like, I'm not saying you can't say that. Fine, no big deal. But theologically, that's not correct. All right? We do not die and become angels. We are human beings. God created us with a human nature, and we will have that human nature in eternity. So human beings have bodies. That means we will get our bodies back at the end of time. When Christ returns, the dead will rise from the grave. St. Paul writes about this. The church professes it. We're going to say it in just a few moments in the creed. I believe in the resurrection of the body. So we believe this, that at, at the end of time, our bodies will rise. Jesus, of course, has already done this, and he has already risen his blessed mother. So Jesus and Mary are already in heaven with a body, and someday we will join them, God willing, again, if you choose heaven as your eternal destiny. Second, something we can say about heaven that it is not, it is not unlimited access to everything that we enjoy in life. So, I love to golf. I'm terrible, but I love to golf. Heaven is not going to be like one Augusta National Golf Course after another and they just keep getting better. Now, I think that'll be part of it. I mean, like like about this much, okay? But it's so much more, so far beyond anything that we can possibly comprehend. Heaven is not an unlimited, you know, like a a never-ending Netflix account or something like that. Rather, here's what the Catechism of the Catholic Church tells us. And I I realized, just a little aside, I realized as I was putting this together, I've mentioned the Catechism the last three weeks, and some people may not know what I'm talking about. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, it's a book about this thick, but it's actually an easy read. You don't read it cover to cover. It is a collection of every teaching of our faith. And you can get it for free online, but I would strongly encourage all of us to have a hard copy in our house that is just on our bookshelf somewhere. You can refer to it. It is a sure resource for teaching the Catholic faith. And so the Catechism of the Catholic Church says this, Heaven is this perfect life with the Most Holy Trinity, this communion of life and love with the Trinity, with the Virgin Mary, with the angels and all the blessed. That we call heaven. Heaven is the ultimate end and the fulfillment of the deepest human longings, the state of supreme, definitive happiness. So in other words, while heaven is not, as I said, a a never-ending Netflix account or something, every desire of the human heart, God is going to satisfy to the nth degree. Even, we could say, the disordered desires of our heart. The disordered desires of our heart, in some way, when you untwist them, are actually a desire for God. And so in purgatory, what's God going to do? He's going to untwist those twisted up, disordered desires, point them towards their proper end, their proper goal of where we're going, 
and then satisfy them to a degree that we couldn't even begin to imagine in heaven. God will also make clear every relationship that we have ever had, beginning with those closest to us, our immediate family. But even the TSA agent that you, you know, he, he or she scanned your passport, you shook their hand, and they said, have a nice flight. That one person, that five-second interaction that you had with that person, in some way, God uses that to touch other people. And in heaven, all of that is going to make sense. He's going to show us, here's how you touch this person, how that person connected here, and, and put all of this together and show us the whole picture. It will be awesome. The relationships that we've had with those that we love will also be brought to their proper conclusion. And when I say proper conclusion, I don't mean they're going to end. I mean they're going to be glorified. We will be more, we will experience deeper and more intimate love with our loved ones in heaven than we ever possibly could fathom here on earth. St. John Paul II wrote what, in my mind, is the greatest synthesis of Scripture ever produced in history. It's known to us today as the theology of the body. Now, this teaching oftentimes is thought of as solely his catechesis on marriage and family life and human sexuality. Now, it, it is that, to be sure, but it's really a teaching on the person of Jesus. And so because this teaching touches on who Jesus is and explains who Jesus is, it touches every aspect of our faith. Every element of our Christian faith is contained here. And so the Pope begins by talking about what was life like prior to the fall when Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then he talks about what's life like right here and now in this world today. But then he goes on and he says, what's it going to be like in the next world after Christ comes again? What is life going to be like there? The analogy he uses is marriage. And it actually makes sense. Why? Because the story of salvation begins in the garden with marriage between Adam and Eve. But that paradise is lost. They fall. And so God sends a redeemer, Christ the new Adam, to be united with his bride, the church, the new Eve, to bring us, his bride, into the new paradise of heaven where we will be united all for all of eternity with Christ, the bridegroom of the church. That's the story of Scripture, the story of salvation in a nutshell. Marriage is an analogy, an icon, if you will, of our relationship with God. Now, certainly no marriage is perfect because no human being, save for Christ and Our, and our Lady, are morally perfect. But that's the analogy that Scripture and, and the Pope, by extension, choose to use to show us that marriage gives us this tiny little glimmer of what heaven is going to be like. That just, I mean, like, that's a taste, if you will. It is the foretaste of the banquet. Now, I've never been married, obviously, but I have been blessed to see people in union with God. The thing that gets me out of bed every day as a priest, the joy of my priesthood, is when I am able to work with people who maybe have never met Jesus Christ. Usually, just the way the arc of life goes, that's a young person, a teenager perhaps. Now, that person may have been baptized, but they've never had that deep, lasting encounter with our Lord. And when it happens, it's life-changing. It's a defining moment for that person. It might be a Steubenville Youth Conference, it might be a focused seat conference. It might be a, like a number of our students right now are at their Kairos retreat. There could be any number of these encounters. But it's that moment when that person meets Jesus for the first time and can say, I knew at that moment, I knew that I knew that I knew that it was all real and that Christ loves me. My hope is that each one of us have a moment like that, a defining moment in our life where we knew God definitively. That too, my brothers and sisters, is about this tiny little bit of an appetizer before the main course of heaven. If you've had a moment like that, recollect that in your mind. That moment gave you just about this much of a taste of what heaven's going to be like. But finally, I want to end with one more story, one more analogy from my own life. 
Many of you know that I am a diehard Pittsburgh Pirates fan. And I mean, like, diehard. The reason I am is they were pretty good when I was a little kid, okay? They won their division in 1990, 1991, 1992. And unfortunately, that was the time where I was starting to become interested in baseball because since then, they were horrible. They had a losing record in 1993, 94, 95, 96, over and over. For 20 years, they lost more games than they won. That is still, to this day, an all-time record for American, like the four major American professional sports. But nonetheless, they were my team, and I picked them, and I wasn't going to turn on them. And so I went through these 20 years, if you will, of baseball purgatory. And then finally, in 2013, everything changed, and the Pirates started to win, and they won some more, and they won some more, and they won some more. They finally qualified for the playoffs. And I remember that beautiful day when they won and they qualified for the playoffs. I think I had a rum and coke or something just to celebrate. Because I never thought I would live to see the day. I really I thought it would never happen. But yet it did. And they got to their first playoff game in 21 years. I waited for that playoff game like a little kid at Christmas. And I remember watching that game. I remember seeing this stadium that I had seen so many times hundreds of times over the previous 20 years where, I mean, you, you could swing a wet cat and not hit, hit anybody for like a 75-foot radius. There was nobody there. But the, the stadium that day was sold out. Everybody was decked out in black, and something truly remarkable happened. If you're a Cincinnati Reds fan, close your ears for about 10 seconds. The fans began to chant the name of the opposing pitcher, Johnny Cueto. Just said over and over, Quato, Quato. He dropped the ball. Now, I have watched hundreds of baseball games in my life. I have never seen a pitcher drop the ball on the mound. But he did. And so the crowd cheered at this because they, they rattled him. He went over, picked up the ball, and delivered his next pitch. That Pirates catcher... Russell Martin proceeded to deposit over the left center field wall. I am certain that you could hear the roar from that stadium here in Iowa. And I am absolutely certain that my neighbors half a mile away could hear me at that moment. (laughs) Now, I don't know what heaven's going to be like, but I know that there is going to be more jubilation there than I felt in that moment when Russell Martin hit that home run. That's enough for me.